So uh, our first speaker is Kelly, Kelly Stanley. And uh, her talk is about tracking cuckoos, determining when and where populations are limited across the annual cycle. And this is a continuation of our surveys and monitoring themes. So yeah, um, this week's symposium is really kind of focused on the Western designated population segment of yellow cuckoos. Um, but today I'm just gonna expand a little more um, and also talk about uh, cuckoos out east. Because um, in reality, cuckoos um, are declining range wide. Uh, so uh, here is just data from breeding bird survey across the range, just showing this decline um, over the last uh, 50 years from breeding bird survey data. Um, and if we kind of look at how these trends vary across the breeding range, most of the regions, as you can see, appear to be suffering from population declines. And that's shown with this BBS data um, with the areas that are red and orange. Um, but we do see that there are areas that appear to be stable or even increasing in population size, which is shown by these greens and yellow areas. And so I was really interested in um, why that might be and what about those regions are leading to more stable populations. And for so for this project that I've been working on uh, during my postdoc, we, uh, we have been hoping, we're hoping to identify what is driving these regional differences in population trends across uh, the breeding range. Um, and so in order to understand the, understand the factors limiting populations across the range, we knew we had to take a full annual cycle approach and take into account processes that are happening, not just in the breeding season, but also during different periods of the annual cycle. So to be able to do that, the first step we, was that we needed to understand patterns of migratory connectivity for yellow-billed cuckoo so that we could connect populations across periods of the annual cycle. Then once we were able to connect populations, we could begin investigating what factors might be driving differential population trends across the breeding range. And so today I'm really going to focus on the first goal, trying to understand patterns of migratory connectivity for yellow bill cuckoos, uh, because that's the priority we have gotten the most uh, done with so far. So this is a species range for yellow bill cuckoos, which I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with. Um, they are thought to winter throughout most of, uh, they were thought to winter throughout most of South America, uh, east of the Andes. Uh, and in terms of migratory connectivity, we didn't really have much information for the species. In the West, yellow-billed cuckoos had been tracked with both light level geolocators and GPS tags. And this uh, map is showing uh, data collected by Southern Sierra Research Station from five birds GPS tracked from the lower Colorado River, suggesting that birds are really from that population are wintering in this kind of southwestern region of the wintering range. And that really kind of agreed with data previously collected from light level geolocators. But aside from a, a handful of uh, tracking projects on the, in the West, we didn't really have much information on migratory connectivity. So to resolve these questions for yellow-billed cuckoo, we uh, decided to use these new, brand new two gram satellite transmitters um, put out by microwave telemetry uh, to uh, resolve patterns of migratory connectivities for cuckoos. We selected breeding populations across the range, uh, but we really wanted to focus on areas of high breeding populations, but also populations that were experiencing different populations trends. And we really used BBS data to guide us to which populations are experiencing different population trends. And so in total, we have eight breeding populations that we deploy tags on, three in the West that we uh, deploy tags in collaboration with Southern Sierra Research Station, and then five populations out East with uh, different population trends. So across these eight breeding populations, we deployed five to 10 tags. Um, we used canopy nets to capture the cuckoos and deploy the tags using kind of standard with full tipton harness. And so let's look at some of the data we've collected. 
So I'll show you a video of the tracks from the first year of deployment in 2019. And we tracked 23 birds from five different breeding populations uh, here. So here's the data. We have Texas, Tennessee, te uh, Illinois, and then the two Arizona sites. So in late August, we can see that the Western birds start to move into Mexico. Um, by late September, the eastern birds have started their migration. They all move into South America. There go the western birds. Once in South America, they all kind of take a similar migration route down uh, to the southwestern portion of the wintering range. We did have two uh, eastern birds that moved first into Brazil, but ultimately all the birds moved back into the same region where all the birds spent most of the winter. And so if we just kind of focus in on all the location estimates we have from South America, this is data from the first two years of the study. In green, we have what was thought to be the wintering range of yellow-billed cuckoos. And then these are all the location estimates. The two, uh, the points in blue are from the two eastern populations. And then the yellow and orange are birds from the two Arizona breeding populations. And what we really see is that in reality, the cuckoos are really occupying a small fraction of the area that we kind of had attributed as yellow-billed cuckoo winter range. And keep in mind, this, these, all these points include migration at, uh, periods. And so really, when we just focus in on the wintering area, uh, birds are spending the majority of the winter in this really small region of South America. And uh, what we realize is that that area corresponds to the Gran Chaco, which is this huge eco region in South America that straddles uh, Bolivia, Paraguay, and Argentina, and a bit of Brazil. And the region is South America's largest dry forest and the second largest biome in, in South America, second only to the Amazon. Um, we also quickly realized that the Gran Chaco is uh, one of the most threatened dry forests in the world and considered a global deforestation hotspot due to agricultural expansion and intensification. And so basically all of our the yellow bill cuckoos that we tracked are spending the winter in this highly threatened ecosystem. And so at first, since we had all the birds from across the breeding range wintering in the Gran Chaco, we thought that yellow bill cuckoos were showing patterns of weak migratory connectivity. But when we zoomed in on the location estimates in the Gran Chaco, we kind of got a different sense um, of what pattern was going on. So here again, I'm just zooming in on the Gran Chaco. Here's all the locations. Um, in blue, we have all the birds, all the locations from birds uh, from eastern breeding populations, and in red, all the birds uh, from western breeding populations. And what we could see was that we were seeing some latitudinal segregation on the wintering grounds with the western breeding populations extending further south into the Gran Chaco compared to the eastern breeding population. And so we are really hoping to, with additional transmitters deployed, uh, either on the breeding grounds or ideally on the wintering grounds, we could really resolve whether these patterns of latitudinal segregation are in fact happening or if this is just an artifact of a small sample size. We've also looked at the migration data, and we really only have good migration data during, for fall migration. And so this map shows all the location estimates we have for the last three years, um, including the partial migration data we have for the birds that were, the tags that were deployed this summer. And so each uh, breeding population is shown here with a different color. And so you can really see that different breeding populations are taking different migration routes into South America. And so we're really seeing strong migratory connectivity as birds move into South America. But then once birds arrive in South America, they're all kind of taking a similar migration route down into the Gran Chaco where they're spending the winter. We've also looked at differences in migration timing across the population. So this is just a box plot showing uh, the average dates of different migration events. So we have departure from the US, departure from North America, arrival in South America, and arrival in the Gran Chaco. In blue, we have the Eastern breeding populations, and in red, the Western breeding populations. And so we see that when the Western birds are departing the US, 
much earlier than uh, the Eastern, uh, usually you leaving sometime in August. And this is the movement that we see across the West with the birds moving into Mexico and spending a month to two months in Mexico before continuing migrating south. Um, overall, the timing of departure from North America, so for the Eastern birds just departing the US, for the Western birds departing Mexico, occurs around the same time. Uh, although they depart North America around the same time, the what, Eastern birds are arriving to South America and Colombia and Venezuela uh, before the Western birds. So the Eastern birds are taking that migration route predominantly over the Caribbean, though some are going through Central America. And the uh, Western birds are taking a longer migration route through Central America. But ultimately, they're all arriving in the Gran Chaco around the same time. And so overall, what we're seeing is all of our yellow-billed cuckoos that we've tracked are moving into the Gran Chaco for the winter. We are seeing latitudinal segregation between eastern and western birds within the Gran Chaco, with western birds further south in the Gran Chaco. Breeding populations are taking different migration routes to South America, but once they reach South America, basically eastern and western populations are taking a very similar route down into the Gran Chaco. And we're seeing differences in both migration route, differences in the routes and the timing of migration between uh, breeding populations. And so with this information about migratory connectivity, we can now begin to link populations. And so what we're hoping to do next is link population trends to remotely sensed environmental conditions uh, from uh, the different breeding and non-breeding grounds. Out east, we are also hoping to use maps data to extract demographic information so that we could hopefully produce an integrated population model. Out west, we don't really have comparable demographic data. So what we're probably going to end up doing is taking different population modeling approaches between the eastern and western populations. And so just to conclude, I wanted to thank all the wonderful volunteers and technicians that have helped out on this population on this project, our wonderful collaborators at Southern Sierra Research Station, and then all of our funding sources. And um, that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks for stopping share. Okay, sweet. So our next presenter is um, Diane Tracy. And um, I actually have her PowerPoint with me, so that's good. Her presentation is Habitat and Conservation Status of Migration Stopover Sites and Wintering Grounds of Western Yellow-Billed Cuckoos Revealed by GPS and Satellite Tags. So let me go ahead and share that. Okay. Hi. My name is Diane Tracy, and I'm going to be presenting information we have collected on migratory stopovers and the wintering habitat of western yellow-billed cuckoos, revealed by geolocators, GPS tags, and satellite tags. And this is based on research conducted from 2001 to the present. First came the light level geolocators that first tracked the cuckoo from New Mexico on the left, and then we tracked one from the LCR on the right. This data from just two individuals gave us the first information on their migratory routes and identified the Gran Chaco as their wintering locations. But the uh, migration routes were a little unclear because of low accuracy, and the points had an average error of over 200 kilometers per point. Also, we only recaptured one of the eight birds we fitted with a geolocator. From 2014 to 15, under the LCR MSCP, we attached low-tech pinpoint 10 GPS tags to 14 cuckoos. The cuckoos needed to weigh over 65 grams and be breeding, basically to increase their chance of recapture. We also took blood samples for sexing. The GPS tags are much more accurate up to 20 meters in open canopy, assuming that they, we have a good satellite coverage at the start of the collection. They are much better than geolocators, but also much less data. We are only basically able to capture 10 locations per tag. Then over the next three years, from 2015 to, to 2017, we tried to recapture them back at their breeding grounds to re retrieve the data. Luckily, we have high site fidelity. We then used cuckoo 
Google Earth and ground truthing to evaluate habitats and threats. The 14 cuckoos tagged, we recaptured seven. One had lost his tag. We downloaded 34 points from six females, including 22 fall migration points in eight countries, three winter points in two countries, and nine migration points in three countries. 22 were in unprotected areas and 12 in protected areas. There were more fall points because tags died over the wintering period trying to connect to the satellites. Let's see this. In 2000 and 2020, we helped deploy the satellite tags in Western Cuckoos on the lower see Colorado, this. we placed 10 tags, Southeast this. Arizona, six tags, and one was deployed on the Kern River this year. And this is a larger map of the Southeast Arizona deployments with the red dots yes. indicating our capture sites. Yes. I think Nick has pretty much described that habitat. From 2019 to 2021, we captured 39 cuckoos with 18 getting satellite tags. We capture about 50% male and female, uh, but we rarely get a male cuckoo that weighs over 65 grams. Again, this is our 2014 to 16 GPS resource. showing that the fall birds hugged the western edge of Mexico and Central America, and the birds just took their time and heading south. With the spring points, the yellow points, the stopover slides were more in inland. Now we have the 2019 and 2021 satellite tag date on the map. The migratory routes are very similar with the satellite bird stopping in many of the same areas as the GPS birds. And the ones that made it there are wintering in the dry Chaco forest. We now have a lot more points, 34 versus 2,365, though we are still lacking in spring migration points. This density map shows Southeast Arizona and LCR cuckoos both spending a considerable amount of time in Sonora and in Western Mexico before heading south. Most of the birds traveled west of the Sierra Madres Occidentales. Keep in mind for future slides, the denser point areas in Mexico, Nicaragua, and the Grand Chaco. Please excuse my bad Spanish. This is a vegetation map showing the forest types that the cuckoos were using as they migrated through Mexico, mostly, mostly different types of tropical dry forest, uh, usually found from sea level up to uh, 1,500 meters. The birds spent a considerable time at that one density point in Sonora, but it is unknown if or how they interacted with the Sonoran cuckoo population. This slide shows the vegetation type through Central America, with again the cuckoos using dry forest and we found that they were sometimes using mangroves. You can see this area there at the Central American dry forest marking that the same as on the density map as cuckoos were stopping out off in this area in Chinandega and Managua. And these are the first two sites that we visited. They're fall and spring sites and visiting them inspired our grand adventure of trying to visit all of our GPS sites. Uh, both were dry desert washes and both were in protected areas. And there's a close-up here, though evidence of recent cattle and off-road use uh, was prominent on the National Monument. This is a fall stop oversight in Nayarit, Mexico. It was not protected. This was a dry oak forest on the top of a very steep mountaintop. We found cattle at almost all the sites we visited. This is a false site at Thorn Scrub Forest in Jalisco, Mexico. Uh, they're not always pristine sites. The site was very eroded and uh, eroded desert gully and there was evidence of heavy grazing and nearby agriculture and it was not protected. This is uh, the mangroves in that uh, high density area in Shenandega, Nicaragua. This point happened to be located on an island, and luckily Paso Pacifico helped us out with a boat and captain. 
Uh, Jose Martin checked out, ch checking out this cuckoo point. These uh, mangroves are young and regenerating, having been previously cut for shrimp farming, then, but luckily they are now protected. Many of the satellite tag birds passed or stopped near this reserve. And this is a fall point in a thorn scrub in Leon, Nicaragua. Uh, the owners lived on this ranch for 52 years and raised 12 children. Uh, you can see that they didn't destroy, destroy all the habitat. Our cuckoos set along this sparsely treed fence line and most of the area though had been filled for, clear for cattle grazing. And note that volcano in the background. It's also not protected. Uh, fall site in Managua, Nicaragua. We found this large tree 100 meters from the point and uh, the only large tree left in the area due to logging unless you count stunts. At this point, at the point, only small trees uh, and they'd been recently logged around the point and the stopover point was right next to a logging road. And as we worked, we heard chainsaws all morning we, and just down the road was an active charcoal pit. This activity is legal, but not well enforced. This is a fall tropical dry forest point in Granada, Nicaragua. Uh, it's basically on a hillside. It was a cow pasture. Though we did find some riparian uh, vegetation with ha howler monkeys on the way to and from the point and cows. And the howler monkeys we consider our indicator species of forest up in Central America. Uh, this is a spring point at Calakmu Biosphere Reserve. The Ejido Valentin Gomez is a small Ejido trying to jumpstart primary forest regeneration by suppressing the understory. This area was logged until the 1980s, but is now protected by the Hito. And this cuckoo stayed here at least five days. These are two spring uh, points where the cuckoos were taking that more inland route. Uh, as we were hiking, we were wondering where the cuckoos were until we walked over a hill and found this mesquite uh, oasis here in Chihuahua. We found many migrating birds in these oases, including Bell's Bureau, Singing Way, and the Coahuila uh, oasis. After crossing over from Central America to South America, the birds seemed to travel pretty fast for these tropical moist forests, and they spent most of their wintering time in the dry chaco forests east of the Andes in Bolivia, Paraguay, and Argentina. The uh, Gran Chaco is an arid subtropical region of low forest and savanna traversed by only two permanent rivers and practically unmarked by roads or rail lines, it is largely uninhabited. It is bounded on the west by the Andes mountain range and on the east by the Paraguay and Parana River. The Gran Chaco extends some 450 miles from east to west and 700 miles from north to south and covers about 280,000 square miles. Uh, slightly more than half lies with in Argentina, a third in Paraguay, and the remainder in Bolivia. And here we are on the Gran Chaco at a wintering point at Tinita in Cisco Agra Pino National Park. It was a dry Chaco forest in Paraguay. And this is considered the climax forest of the region. Driving from that national park on the Trans Chaco Highway, the road is very bad, muddy, and slow going. And we occasionally spotted a cuckoo hopping in the vegetation. This is a winter point in the Gran Chaco Forest uh, near Salto, Argentina, where we did find cuckoos. And this is a wintering point around Corbelado Reserve on the border with Paraguay. And we found yellow bill cuckoos, but we were sometimes fooled by these sneaky dark bill cuckoos. After we began recognizing what we considered potential cuckoo habitat, we could just stop by the road and play one to two cuckoo calls, usually with a smooth response. And after seeing the large numbers of cuckoos in the area, we began to think that there must be wintering eastern cuckoo birds in this area as there were too many for our western population. We also saw an association between locusts, swarming grasshoppers, and cuckoo presence. Though we did not believe they were eating these grasshoppers, it probably indicated recent rains.
Locale, you may have already mentioned this, the main threat to this error is deforestation and the conversion of the forest to soy and cattle. Uh, this map is, uh, data is out of date, it's much worse now. You can see the two of our winning birds were in the protected area and one was not, but the trouble is they move around a lot. So what's the future? We have a lot of work to do. We need to stop deforestation across the range. We need to conduct more research on the wintering grounds. I uh, wish to thank the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Southern Sierra Research Station, and our field biologists, uh, cuckoos and surveyors in Southeast Arizona that provided some of our locations, and our Smithsonian co-researchers. Thank you. Awesome. Sorry if I was distracting everyone. I practice people's names uh, during these talks. I'm sorry. <laughs> and also I can't um, touch my computer when I'm playing someone's presentation. So for the next talk, we have Alberto, Alberto Macias Duarte with um, Abundance and Occupancy of the Western Yellow-Billed Cuckoo in Sonora, Mexico. And you should be good to share. Oh, thank you. Let me see. Um, well, um, thank you for inviting me to present here. Uh, I am Alberto Macias Duarte from the from Sonora State University here in Hermosillo. I'm going to present today the results of five years of monitoring yellow bill cuckoos uh, during the summer in, in, in here in, in several places locations in Sonora. Uh, this study was mostly fu funded by Arizona Game and Fish. And, and so I will start on, the, on, on my presentation. I cannot make it advance, okay. Well, geographic variation in abundance throughout the uh, species range is ubiquitous in, uh, among species and Something that it is uh, concerning is when we usually have in mind what is called the abundant central model that the that the species tends to be abundant in the in the center when where they meet all their optimal conditions and the periphery it is suboptimal so uh, demographic rates are supposed to be lower uh, fecundity because in those areas the the uh, the species meet uh, unfavor uh, not optimal conditions. But when the, as, as we have in this range map of the yellow bill cuckoo, when the central part is becoming to, uh, the central part of the range is, uh, the populations in the central part of the range become to uh, uh, decrease. Uh, so it is, it is kind of a mystery how come the center it becomes to decrease and the periphery seems to be robust or I mean, uh, mostly uh, what, what is happening with the periphery in this case, uh, Sonora, it is in the southern tip of the breeding distribution for the uh, distinct population segment of the Western yellow bill cuckoo. So uh, we center our interest in that region uh, uh, because uh, if we are gonna, if we got a conserve a species, if, we're, if we have to conserve a species, we have to consider the totality of the range. Most of the talks here about the breeding distribution have been in the US, but what happens in the Mexican side. And also uh, Sonora may be highly relevant for, uh, 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 for us. Populations in Sonora may be highly relevant for the conservation of the species in the neighboring Arizona. So with, there is not much information about the abundance of yellow bill cuckoos uh, here in Sonora. Uh, and we, this study intended to, to increase a little bit the, the, the understanding of, of the population dynamics in this part of the breeding range. So we had a, as an objective to determine the status of yellow bill cuckoo populations in Sonora estimate abundance and occupancy rates, and also determine the contribution of non-riparian habitats to the cuckoo's population dynamics. It is, well, it is well known that 
yellow bill cuckoos, as we have seen in this in other presentation, that not only occupy uh, riparian areas, but also uh, desert arroyos and other areas that, uh, and we certainly wanted to uh, monitor those areas too. Uh, because probably here in the southern tip of the breeding distribution, um, uh, yellow bill cuckoos may be more tolerant to other conditions, to other ha habitat types. So what we did was to survey uh, 13 to 16 sites per year from 2015 to 2019, partially following the, the standard survey protocol. What is that partially? Well, because we only do, uh, conducted what is called the, the second and the third standard survey periods. So we, did, we, didn't, we didn't survey during the first period, uh, mostly because, because time and, and, and budget constraints. So we, ha we had to decide what to sample and we decided those two periods. Well, here in this, in this map, I'm showing a little bit some of the results, but those were the sites that we uh, where we surveyed for, for yellow bill cuckoos. The, uh, the circles in, in, in blue are riparian areas, in red, desert arroyos areas, and upland habitat, the, the black circles. And we, we mostly cover what, what, what is, what is uh, from, uh, from the coastal plain towards the mountain. We don't cover, not, not, we don't cover any site in now in northwestern Sonora, where the Colorado River is. So uh, we, we conducted surveys in riparian habitat. What, what this is cl the classic riparian uh, habitat in the southwest, cotton, uh, uh, cottonwoods, willows, uh, and mesquite as, as the three component in perennial uh, water. With perennial water, we also had the we another type of habitat where we survey what were desert arroyos. These are well, intermittent uh, creeks uh, uh, with a bosky forest, mostly mostly dominated by uh, desert ironwood, mesquite, acacia species. Uh, they don't have perennial water. Uh, most of, of the year and, and and well I like this this photograph because it shows uh, the, the uh, a yellow bell cuckoo during during this period this period in 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 a desert arroyo habitat with species that are not found in the in the US mostly some Wayacan and and, and 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 some kind of palo some other species of palo verde but it shows, uh, for me, this shows that the variety of habitats where, where the species may be breeding. We also, we, and the third kind of habitat where we survey for, for yellow bill cuckoos where upland habitat basically is foothills or ma ma uh, mountainous terrain with uh, open, open forest, mostly oak, although in some sites we have a tropical deciduous forest in one side. And we followed, uh, uh, concerning the, the way we, we carried out the, the, the sampling, it was just like the protocol. We, we started before sunrise and, and continued uh, surveying until 11, or it was until temperature reached 40 Celsius degrees. Sometimes we had to, to, do, uh, to start, sorry, to, to finish. Uh, earlier because security con uh, concerns of also, yeah, the, the access to the land. Uh, we, we, in an initial broadcast point, we either detected or elicited the yellow bill cuckoo response uh, using uh, contact, contact and, and call, call calls spaced one minute, minute apart. Again, if no bird was detected, we moved one, one meter in the direction of the river of the path set for the new broadcast point. For, especially for some upland habitats, we may not have a river or, or a drainage, so we, but we had a defined, a predefined route what to follow. And if we detected a cuckoo, 
uh, we just place the other point 300 meters away. The way we analyze this data set that we collected using a Bayesian hierarchical model to estimate occupancy in this way, occupancy is defined as the probability that the cuckoo is present at a broadcast point. So it is at, at the low, at the lowest, at the finest scale. And we and we use a program open, open box to estimate model parameters. And what was the what what was the how the we built the model? Basically, the state process, the process of of occupancy. We we whether whether a bird, sorry, whether a, a cuckoo was present of, of uh, absent in a in a survey point, we model it as a Bernoulli random variable, and uh, with parameter occupancy, C letter C. And occupancy dependent, the, uh, we built as a as a as a response uh, to latitude, longitude, elevation, date, uh, temperature, rain, and habitat type, and some interactions. So basically, those variables were candidates to for a model to to determine occupancy. And and about the the observation process, well, whether a, a bird was detected or not, also was modeled as a Bernoulli random variable. I.e., whether the yeah this, the the cuckoos were were detected or not depended on, on on whether the species was present and whether and its detection probability. And detection probability we model it as a uh, as a function of time uh, to, to determine temporal trends, daily trends in, in detection uh, during the surveys. Well, uh, our results for this, uh, uh, for these uh, surveys were that we had, uh, following the standard protocol, we had a count of nine cuckoos per transect, uh, uh, an overall an overall mean, but we saw some variation. In this plot, we can see in the x-axis the uh, year, and and we can see that in every in every year sites had to. Uh, we can see that the, the two the two surveys per year, and also uh, the same sites were uh, look uh, the same sites are linked by that by by a line. So we can see in the first in the first year we only sampled riparian sites, and we can also see this in uh, the trend, decreasing trend, in in uh, from the second and the third uh, survey periods. In this case, our first and second survey, and 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 we can see and we so we we maintain five sites that we monitor throughout the the five the five years. And we, we don't see a, a, like an annual trend, a temporal trend in, in, in the cuckoo count. And so um, from two, starting in 2016, we included other, other sites because precisely we wanted to, to know what, how occupancy behaved in other types of habitat. And, and we, we also, something intriguing here is that our highest cuckoo count was not on riparian sites, not a, was in a desert arroyo site. And, and well, and, and that was like that. Yes, I, I personally was in that, in, that, in that count. So it was, they weren't my field technicians. So, yeah. And uh, so we, we don't, the overall occupancy rate from the model is that uh, there's a 54% uh, probability that a broadcast point is going to be occupied by a, at a, by a um, yellow bill cuckoo in all habitats that, uh, where we, where we uh, uh, survey. And the, uh, from all the models possible for, for, for occupancy, well, we found that longitude, latitude, elevation, and date were, were variables that 
had an, a real effect on occupancy. Surprisingly, habitat type was not a, a variable that determined yellow bill cook occupancy. And this was counterintuitive. We thought that the riparian areas were going to have higher occupancy rates. But yeah, veg, uh, habitat type was not in, in the best model. And it was, in, in, even in other models, it was not a significant factor. Uh, and here we are. We are attempting to. We attempt to to model the the geographic variation in in occupancy. So we have in circles each each, each survey site. It is shown in circles. The area of each circle is proportional to the occupancy rate, and 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 the lines are a are a heat map for 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 occupancy. So we can see that there is a gradient in some, uh, uh, just like elevational grade, uh, the elevational gradient, we have an, a gradient from west to east on yellow built cuckoo occupancy. So, and this map uh, has to be interpreted as what would be the occupancy provided there, are, there is enough uh, uh, tree cover. So we, we don't mean in this exercise that every site for example, on the Yaki River uh, basin, is going to be high. It's going to be high, but if it has uh, if it has uh, tree cover, it will it, yeah it will have a, a high occupancy rate. And, and and we also were surprised that some some sites uh, near the uh, in very in, in very arid in the more more. In the driest part of the of the of the uh, Sonora Plain, were also had also yellow billed cuckoos. We see a, the seasonal variation in, in occupancy. Well, we as as the other presentations uh, uh, in agreement with the other presentations, we see a, a, a decrease in occupancy from er, from late June to mid August. That was the period where our surveys, uh, when our surveys took place, we see a, a consistent decline. Uh, the date was a, a significant variable in our occupancy model. And this is additional data. So we also see that there is a decline in detection probability. So detect, uh, detection probabilities uh, range from almost 25% to 10% from 6 to a.m. to 11 a.m. So, and, and as conclusions, we can conclude from this study that the, the yellow bill cuckoo population in Sonora seems robust. They occupy diverse kinds of habitats. They seem tolerant to, to, uh, to have, to more tolerant to habitat requirements. They even are in the most arid part of the of the state, uh, uh, but we also have the caveat that that we didn't we didn't uh, survey for nest. So we, uh, however, we had evidence of nesting, uh, not in this study, but we have seen yellow bill cuckoo nesting in in desert arroyos here, and also we saw pairs copulating. So and. So we, we that makes us think about so if, if there is not much difference between riparian areas and other kind of habitats, probably the the uh, the contribution of of non non riparian uh, uh, habitats is significant to maintaining populations of yellow billed cuckoos in Sonora. But we don't have to forget that all tree cover is in, is, is in peril here in, in Sonora, even desert arroyos or whatever, uh, I mean, riparian areas, everything it is under, uh, it is being decimated by agriculture, agriculture, urbanization, uh, water pumping, et cetera. So it doesn't mean that even if the non-riparian areas are Significant. It doesn't mean that the, the yellow bill cuckoos there are not threatened. And well, be, before I, I I finish my presentation, I also would like to 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 thank uh, 
the uh, my field technicians and the students student volunteers that uh, uh, conducted the surveys and also Edwin Fares from uh, from Arizona Game and Fish Department who was instrumental for the funding of this of this um, project. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to. Okay, so we'll we're going to get to questions in um, right after Edwin's talk. So Edwin is our last presenter for the day. And um, Edwin Juarez, sorry. And he will be speaking about the Western yellow billed cuckoo range wide occupancy assessment project. So, Edwin, you should be able to share. Uh, well, um, I'm glad I'm glad to be the last person of the day so we can quickly jump into some discussion if there's uh, time for that. Um, uh, this presentation, we're not presenting any results. Is actually we wanted to talk about a project that we have been collaborating, um, putting together with multiple partners across the DPS of uh, Yellow Bear Cuckoo. Uh, are you hearing me well right now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And so I'm yes. briefly going to no, thank you. I'm briefly going to outline um, the project, the objectives. Uh, the different roles of the states and other partners participating a timeline of the project and um and so this is a collaboration uh that involves states from the pacific flyway they have uh cuckoos um you know within the range of the cuckoos uh, also uh, Texas parks and wildlife and other ngo partners um listed here and also with funding from the fish and wildlife service to the competitive sea uh program Next slide, please. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, other collaborators. Uh, this proposal came together with contributions from multiple partners uh, that were listed in the first slide. And so um, I'm basically uh, presenting the objectives of the partnership. Um, so one of the main objectives of this, of this project is to develop a Western DPS wide distribution model and this distribution model will be used to um, help us define the define the study area to implement a statewide a range-wide survey to gather data on cuckoos and also to estimate occupancy across the DPS. And then uh, another objective is to assess the fishing probability and evaluate the effects on our use as an alternative survey method um, kind of similarly to the work that Nick it earlier and I think another presenter. Uh, next slide, please. And so just diving in a little bit, this is uh, this presentation is really just an overview to kind of bring everyone up, um, make everyone aware of the project and um, present some of the objectives and timelines for the work. So um, for the first for the first objective in developing this species distribution model, we're gonna be uh, taking the current available cuckoo locations um, that we've uh, collected from across the range uh, from multiple partners and also from the different uh, Fish and Service Office and uh, state agencies. Um, so we've done a data call for that. We'll be using that data and, <clears throat> and remotely sensed data to develop a model. Um, and we're looking at um, the modeling approach right now. Uh, this is something that's being led by, by Utah uh, and partners in Utah. And then we'll take that SDM uh, to identify petition. Um, the first iteration of the SDM will identify potential breeding habitat throughout the DPS, and that will help us uh, to inform the sampling design for the 2022 surveys uh, this coming season. Um, after we conduct the surveys, um, We'll refine the model um, by the data that we'll be collecting and also the habitat data from that effort in 2022. Uh, next slide. So the the <clears throat> using that SDM model uh, from a, from the first objective, we'll we'll use that to create a, a uniform sampling framework for the range-wise surveys, and 
we plan on sampling uh, across selecting a random sample from across the DPS uh, using a specially balanced approach uh, and stratification. Uh, right now, we're in the process of um, testing out the stratifications and um, um, and we're currently building the model. Um, and so we will have that ready pretty soon. And then again, the survey results will be used to, to refine that model and to identify and estimate occupancy uh, range wide. Next slide. Thank you. And again, um, this is a, an objective that the, the third objective of the proposal is we'll be doing a ARU study to assess the infection probability and evaluate the effectiveness of using this unit as, as an alternate alternate survey method, which I, you know, based on some of the work that Nick presented, um, it's I think very promising. And this objective is being led, uh, being led by uh, California, who's one of our partners in the, in the project. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide. So uh, just to kind of lay out a little bit of how the, the project is organized, uh, Utah uh, has the lead on um, helping us build the model for the study design, for selecting our, our sampling effort. Uh, California is, uh, has the lead on the ARU, ARU objective. And then all the states and NGO partners are collaborating and will be collaborating on implementing the range-wide surveys with Arizona and SSRS. Uh, conducting surveys in Arizona and collaborating with uh, several of the other states to implement the surveys in those states. Um, you can see here, uh, Utah will be facilitating surveys in, in, their, in their region and, um, and so forth. And so this is a multi-state, multi-partnership uh, uh, collaborative effort. We also have uh, three other states that are, are part of the flyway. They will be, um, they're not part of the CISU proposal, but they're, they're part of the project in terms of um, conducting surveys um, to coincide with, with this project. Uh, next slide. So um, I think I said some of this already. Um, Arizona is serving as the lead for the, for the project uh, with significant support from other partners, uh, including California and Utah. Uh, but Arizona will be uh, working together with SSRS in providing overall project management and partner coordination. And um, California and Utah, I will be also helping us with that. Next slide. Okay, I'm back. I think I got kicked out. Um, thanks for us for clarifying that. Uh, this is just to kind of give folks a sense of the timeline for the project. Uh, like I said earlier, right now we we did a data call from states and other partners to build the model. We're work, we're in the process of building the model right now. Uh, we'll be conducting surveys this coming uh, this coming breeding season, and then with the products and outputs in 2023, 2024. Uh, next slide. Uh, and one of the one of the things that we'll need to um, that we would like to consider is, uh, as we've heard today, there's multiple partners, you know, doing uh, cookie surveys throughout the range with different projects, different studies, and we want to explore the feasibility of um, incorporating some of those surveys in into a, you know, a broader analysis range-wide. And so that's something that we're, we, we want to have a conversation with folks um, further down the line, but we wanted to kind of bring that up as, as, a, as a point right now. Next slide. Uh, 
I think this is just uh, recapping some some of the you know the expected results. Uh, we'll we'll be uh, producing this regional habitat distribution model, um, providing uh, occupancy information of those sampled areas, um, and providing DPS wide occupancy estimates, and also uh, doing that study on AR use and the. The goal of this is to um, have this SDM and occupancy data set uh, enable an evaluation of multiple scale habitat and landscape influences on occupancy, which will help the states and also contribute to the services uh, species status assessment, which was uh, introduced earlier this morning during this, during this webinar. I think that's my last slide. I know that was a, just a brief overview with not a lot of details, but we wanted to um, share the, the plans of the project with the with the working group, and um, and so uh, that, that's it. Thank you. Thanks for helping with the slides. I anticipated that was going to be a problem. <laughs> of course, it works out great. Um, so we're actually going to just very quickly move into the final panel discussion. If anyone has any questions, this is your time to ask, especially of the last presenters we had, Callie Stanley, Diane Tracy, Alberto Mayas, Macias Duarte, and Edwin Juarez. So any questions? I did see that Callie was answering some questions in the chat. Um, if you want to give an overview of that, I think that would be nice. Yeah, Joaquin had asked about um, some of the birds that you see, um, like in eBird that are further south, um, in Argentina and Uruguay. Um, and even like Nick Bailey, he showed that map with um, like museum specimens, and it really shows that there's cuckoos like in the special like kind of coastal, not coastal, but um, in Brazil as well. And we're just not getting many birds out there. Um, and so I think part of it is that those could be birds from populations we haven't sampled 100%, um, especially some of those peripheral populations, because we were really trying to sample in areas of high breeding populations for cuckoos. Um, and uh, so some of those birds could be coming from there. It could also be that those birds are just making winter movements and um, they're not actually spending the entire winter in those uh, other areas of South America. And so we did have the two birds in the first year that went into Brazil first and spent quite a lot of time in there before coming into the Gran Chaco. We have another bird doing that this year. Um, so it could be that some of those additional areas are really just, uh, areas that birds move into at some point in the season, um, but are ultimately spending some time in the ground chakra. But yeah, that's still an unanswered question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so we do have a question for Alberto. Um, Thank you for your excellent presentation is what they say first. And then do you have any ideas about why habitat might not have been a significant predictor um, of your yellow-billed cuckoo occupancy? Well, yes. There are several possibilities. The one is that there is a large variation within. There was a large variation within the, uh, within the, the, the number of detections within each habitat type. Uh, yeah, riparian areas were consistent, I would say consistent, consistently high in detections but we also had some other habitat types that had some transects that had some sites that had a, a large number of detection. Also, this, this study, unfortunately, is not, uh, it's a, doesn't have a balanced design. So, so we, we don't have like the same number of, of habitats per year sampled. So there may be some, 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 uh, this, the sampling may, may have affected a little bit our ability to, to, to get better inferences. And, uh, and also then, then the, the model may need to be improved a little bit in the, in, the, in, the way we, in the way we define the processes for 
both for detection and both for and, and for occupancy. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm also intrigued for that in for that question too. But that that was what the analysis uh, uh, gave us. Got it. Thank you very much. Okay, and then. Um... Just there's one more question and I'll shoot it to Kelly, but I just want to make sure that okay there's a couple more but just for the essence of time I know that we said we would end at 430 if you want to stay on for. Um, a couple more questions that's fine with me um, I can hang out, but um, just to sum up. Thank you so much to all of our presenters for presenting your content today, um, it was pretty. Amazing, very, very interesting for me, a novice in all of this. Um, and also thank you to everyone that tuned in. Thank you to all the organizers of this meeting. You did a great job. It's very, very organized. Um, for tomorrow, day two is from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's mountain time. We do have a Padlet link that we shared and I can share again in the chat a little bit earlier. And that link is just to start collecting ideas and generating thoughts about um, for, for the purpose of this, of this workshop and meeting. So I will share that again in the chat. And if you have any questions, it's a really easy platform to use. It's very, it's very easy. If you have any questions, if you run into any problems, email Jenna. She decided she was the point person for that. So I'm gonna put this in the chat right now. There we go. There's the Padlet link. And so for the two questions that just came in, everyone said lots of thank yous and I have lost the questions. <laughs> so, um, Callie, have you been able to make any links between those green increasing populations and wintering grounds versus the declining po populations? So we haven't started that analysis yet. Um, in terms of the wintering populations, it does seem like in terms of the eastern, they're all kind of mixing um, in the Gran Chaco. I, I did talk about how that Eastern and the Western seem to be segregating. So it might be interesting to see if some of the differences in population trends between Eastern and Western could be explained by different processes happening in the Gran Chaco. Um, one of the big challenges that I we still haven't really figured out how to deal with is that um, cuckoos just move a lot. And on the breeding grounds, they're moving constantly, especially in the East. And so like, you know, we see that the Western populations we've worked with, the birds, you know, starting in July, start moving into Mexico. So they're not even spending like a full breeding season necessarily at the same site. The same thing is happening on the east, um, but it's much more diverse, like what area they go to. So even defining some of those populations, like those green areas, you know, we have birds that we tag in Illinois, that's a green area, but before the end of the, you know, breeding season, they'll end up in Pennsylvania. Um, and so this is just like a thing with cuckoos that we're realizing they're moving a lot. Same thing goes in the Gran Chaco. I didn't discuss this, but even in the Gran Chaco, the birds are constantly moving. Um, and these movements are like hundreds to 200 kilometers uh, between sites. So yeah, it's a species that, yeah, I'm still figuring out how to handle all that. They get around. That's cool. Okay, so this um, is directed to Edwin, Russ, and others. I'm really excited for the CSWG funded coordinated survey next year. Two follow ups. One, any chance of having Alberto and colleagues also survey some of their long running sites? And they say four plus years of prior data in the Senora simultaneously. That's like, I think for Sonora, the challenge is that the modeling approach doesn't extend into Mexico because of the differences in the vegetation layers available. They're, they don't, uh, they're not the same across borders. And so we would not be able to develop a, a sampling framework that encompasses Mexico. So that, that's part of the challenge. I think in terms of doing multiple years as part of a additional CISWIC project. I think that's something that the partnership has discussed and it's something that we will be open to pursuing, I think, um, based on, you know, 
the outcomes from our uh, this first uh, run at surveys range wide. I don't know if Ross or anyone else from the partnership would like to add something. Oh, I'll just speak in briefly. This is Russ Robles from Salt Lake City. Hey, um, would love to be, we'd love to coordinate or help coordinate more work across meaningful parts of the range. This particular funding source is um, limited to a U.S. perspective, unfortunately, but that's um, how it starts anyway. And some of the data layers we're currently working with are not available in in Mexico, which is also a problem. So it would be. Those are those are issues. Those are those are problems to solve, but not not dilemmas that we have to live with. Um, we learn, we should like to look forward to doing something more collaborative going forward, and perhaps we just need to look for a more diverse funding source to do that. It's interesting that you mentioned that because that's the second part of this question, which is how do we go about seeking funds for multiple years of simultaneous surveys across much of the range to get a better sense of how interrelated population fluctuations might be across the range. And that's to Russ and Edwin and colleagues. Can I take it, Edwin, or <laughs> Go ahead, Russ. My connection is pretty crappy. Okay, I, it's a great question, Mira. Um, this the intent of this work is really to establish a west a western GPS baseline. Um, so it's very much a snapshot. It's going to be very much imperfect. Um, it is a step towards something that we hope is all we all will be find useful. Um, and that's is really, I guess. The best defense I can I can go for it, it will I am sure fall short of many of our goals, uh, many of our intents. But it's uh, it's a it will be we hope a good start, uh, a good baseline for us all to work from, and to ask more regional questions as well. Okay. Um, and we have um. I don't know how much, we'll just, we'll stop at 10 minutes. We have just a couple more minutes. Um, Callie, have you thought about tagging them on the wintering grounds? Yeah, I, I answered this in the chat. And yeah, we've been actively trying to get grants to, to work in the Gran Chaco. Last year, we were all ready to deploy tags because we had tags that we couldn't deploy because of COVID. And we were all ready to go, um, but yeah, COVID happened and we couldn't deploy those tags and we had to get them out because tags only last so long. So we deployed them this summer in the breeding ground. But yeah, we're actively trying to find funding sources that want to fund work in the Gran Chaco. So if people have ideas, <laughs> please <laughs> let me know. Got it. Okay, so last one is for Edwin. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I was just going to add that as we learn a lot more about the wintering distribution and migration patterns of the some of this work that was presented today, I think it will really uh, define those linkages between um, breeding ground, you know, the breeding grounds and relate those to states that have cuckoos. And I think that in the future may facilitate uh, uh, funding for learning more about wintering threats to the species and uh, including, you know, uh, lo loss, um, loss of habitat and how we can mitigate that. And I think working through Southern Wings and uh, also uh, the NIMCA program of Fish and Wildlife Service might be another vehicle where we can be, have targeted approaches to addressing those wintering needs as we learn more about, especially where they're wintering and the specific locations and when they arrive. You know, a, a lot of this information that was presented today is, is really, helpful and uh, I think the instrumental in, in um, directing, in my mind, some additional funding for work in the winning ground. Okay, so this last question is for you again, Edwin. Um, do you consider when determining how you will make adjustments to surveys in 2023, the huge population fluctuations that can occur between years is a, at a given site seen in several areas like Bill Williams, NWR, Kerr, and Sacramento Rivers. So do you take um, those into account? Do you just adjust for those? I think Ross 
kind of answered this a little bit earlier where you know we recognize that this is kind of a snapshot picture of this one survey effort and that there's going to be limitations to to uh, because of that but i think uh, we we see this as, as providing a baseline uh and that we you know we would look to see how we can address those realities in a, in a follow-up survey or, or a, a, a additional work in the future. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I think that answers that question. Sweet. Thank you again to all of our presenters today and we'll see everyone bright and early tomorrow morning. Kristen, I had a question. This is Jenna. I was wondering, will there be a new link set sent out for tomorrow for like day two or do we use the same link we can use we can use the same link I hope that I'm not just like shooting myself in the foot right now but yes we <laughs> should be able okay. to use the same link Great. Thank um, you. yeah of course everyone have a good night <laughs>